All right. Hi. Um, I want to say thanks to everybody on here. I'm Kim with Vitology Skincare, and we are at an Ask the Expert hangout with Dr. Carlos Mead, uh, Carlos Gomez Mead, excuse me. Uh, he's a board certified dermatologist and a fellowship trained MO surgeon with Phytology, and he practices in Bastrop in San Marcos, Texas. And we're here to just hang out, uh, kind of discuss skin cancer dermatology, um, and take questions and discussions on sunscreen, tanning, uh, skin cancer treatments, as well as skin care. Okay. Um, and I'm kind of going to do a brief introduction on our dermatology topic just because there's been a lot of media hype about tanning, uh, tanning salons as well as the tanning mom, I think it was Patricia Klenzel uh, that was in the media who brought her kid and um, it kind of just brought to light that skin cancer is not something that happens just to people over the age of 50, it's becoming more common in younger uh, adults as well as teenagers. Uh, melanoma, which is the deadliest form of skin cancer, is the most common cancer for 25 to 29 year olds, as well as the second most common for 15 to 29 year olds. Um, and it's increasing at a rate that suppresses almost all the other cancers, lung, colon, breast, and prostate combined. Um, so with that statistic, I say one in five Americans will have skin cancer in their lifetime. So somebody watching this hangout uh, will develop skin cancer or may have already had it. So in addition, we've invited Kelly Mack, a physician assistant from the Skin and Laser Surgery Associates with Dr. Aaron Joseph in Houston. She's joined us as well today. Um, and I want to thank everybody else for joining. Uh, and we're just going to kind of go over, you know, dermatology and skin cancer topics and have any uh, questions or discussions that you have. So I'd like to start, um, and Dr. Gomez Mead, you can take it away from here. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Carlos Gomez Mead. I uh, am a uh, board certified dermatologist and fellowship trained Mohs uh, skin cancer surgeon. Uh, here in the uh, Central Texas Austin uh, area. Uh, I practice mainly out of uh, Bastrop, Texas and San Marcos, Texas, uh, but uh, our practice is actually affiliated uh, in the uh, periphery of Austin, Texas. Um, <clears throat> I um, uh, uh, am glad to do this uh, uh, video. Uh, we're providing this as a platform uh, to help inform people and reach out uh, to people that may have questions um, for me at this time um, about skin cancer, about uh, a lot of the information that's out there regarding uh, sunscreen, um, uh, skin cancer prevention. Uh, of course, the hot topic now is uh, tanning bed. Uh, exposure and the uh, risks associated with that uh, or potential risks um, and uh, I uh, a little bit more about me I uh, originally from Texas uh, did my uh, residencies in, uh, in South Florida uh, where we obviously were exposed to a lot of uh, skin cancer there I did a residency in family practice for three years, then I did a uh, dermatology residency for three years, and then I did a uh, Mohs Micrographic Surgery and Procedural Dermatology Fellowship for one year um, in uh, South Florida. And so uh, down there, as you can imagine, we uh, sort of uh, came across every spectrum of skin cancer you could possibly uh, come across um, because of the... Uh, uh, exposure to a lot of sun damage down there um, uh, and uh, of course living in Florida uh, the, the also known as the sunshine state uh, you you do have uh, potential risks for a lot of uh, you know obvious sun damage but that goes for uh, pretty much everywhere uh, including Texas um, and uh, since moving here um, uh, I have noticed that the same uh, numbers as far as skin cancer um, that I come across in my practice uh, as I did even in Florida and uh, so uh, on that note um, I'll open it up to everybody to ask any 
uh, questions that you may have, um, and uh, I'll try my best to answer those, of course. Uh, yeah, I have a question for you. Yes. So my name's Sarah. I uh, work in marketing here in Austin, and I just turned 30, so that's kind of why I wanted to join this uh, hangout today. I've obviously become a little more concerned about my skin health and where it's going. And, um, you know, as far as skin cancer is concerned, um, it's something I've never thought much about. I tend to lather on the sunscreen every time I'm outside just because I have really fair skin and I don't want to get burned, but um, is, is, is there an equal danger to putting on sunscreen with a lot of, you know, potentially cancer-causing chemicals <clears throat> in the sunscreen, or how, what, what's your take on that? that? That's actually a really interesting question, and as a matter of fact, um, it's definitely a topic of discussion that I'm seeing now more in, in my practice. Um, a lot of patients are reaching out towards more of the natural products and organic products uh, for the sunscreen. Um, generally, um, their sunscreen is divided into what are called the organic and inorganic sunscreens, and those are the ones that the FDA has actually tested the most. And um, the what what's called organic is not what uh, you would you know uh, or I would perceive to be organic, uh, as in like maybe organic produce or organic uh, anything else. It's, by organic, it's uh, basically synonymous with chemical sunscreens. Um, and a lot of these sunscreens um, are more based on the absorption of the photons of the sun's rays, um, whereas the inorganic, which are more what are called physical blockers, um, are more like the titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, and those actually will reflect the sun. Um, so that's the difference between two. The organic chemical will absorb the photons, and the inorganic uh, which are the physical blockers, will reflect the photons. And so that's the difference between the two. But um, there's no real studies as far as uh, potential harm of lathering up, you know, too much sunscreen. Um, the, the, when the studies are done to determine what the SPF value is, uh, they base it on about, oh, about two milligrams per square centimeter of skin. In other words, um, it ends up being about a quarter of an eight-ounce bottle, um, it, this, which is as much as they put on. So if you think about it, um, that amount of sunscreen, most people don't put that on. <laughs> you know, most people put on a very, very thin layer. So, um, but to, to answer your question, um, that's a large quantity of sunscreen, um, and you most likely are not putting on that much um, uh, amount because most people simply don't. Um, though that's what really is the minimum, considered the minimum, so that you can have the SPF uh, value that the bottle says it has, right? And so um, uh, uh, there, there's no real uh, evidence that shows that they, they uh, can potentially be harmful or cancerous or anything of that sort. Um, if there is any potential for cancer, it's the lack thereof, right? And so, um, but as far as internal cancers, um, there's never been any studies, but um, there's some, uh, from what I understand, a few, uh, uh, some ongoing studies about um, if there is any potential harm of, of providing uh, uh, the sunscreens and, and that sort of thing, and, and what specific chemicals, you know, can um, cause any, uh, for, I know, for example, uh, 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 there have been studies on um, uh, overuse, uh, but in that sense, it's more um, overuse uh, in the sense that uh, you know there could uh, you know there could be a risk of of maybe systemic absorption. But that goes for pretty much anything you put on, including insect spray and insect repellents too. So that's still sort of ongoing. To answer your question, yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question pretty well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So just. Um, simply, if I'm if I'm headed to the store and I want to pick up some some sunscreen, is there are there a couple of chemicals or um, you know a specific SPF that you'd recommend? And do I really need to buy something different for my face, or can I use the same thing? Well, um, I don't have any um, you know particular you know brand um, you know bias or anything like that. That you know there, I don't 
you know, work for a particular company that tells me to use their products over others. But one thing that, you know, what I tend to do is kind of keep on track with all the uh, popular sunscreens that are out there and actually try them out myself and maybe distribute them to family members and then get some feedback and distribute some to patients and then get some feedback. And um, there are a few differences as far as sunscreen for your face and for the rest of your body, and that's based more on oil control. Um, there's a lot of people who have oily faces, and so putting on one of the greasy, greasier sunscreens is not something that you know you, you may be wanting to put on your face, particularly if you're prone to getting acne and that sort of thing, or if you have sensitive skin in general. And so there's a few brands out there uh, that do have oil control properties that are a little bit safer on the face. In fact, that's uh, what I use. Um, and the new minimum requirement now is SPF 30. <clears throat> so a lot of people don't really understand what SPF is, and there's a general sort of way to get an idea of, of what um, SPF actually means. And it's actually a big complex formula, but um, to give you the sort of uh, 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 summary of what SPF really means is um, if you are typically fair skin, uh, you may, in at when the sun is at its highest peak, which is called the, the zenith of the sun, which is typically uh, noon, uh, more or less, right? So 10 to 2, more or less. So that's when the sun's rays are at the strongest. Um, a fair-skinned person, meaning uh, what we call the Fitzpatrick skin types, which is 1 to 6, 1 being red hair, blue eyes, and very, very fair skin, and 6 being dark, dark skin, um, and so if you're a one or two, um, then you typically will start getting what's called the MED, uh, minimal uh, arithmo arithmogenic uh, dose, which is the minimal amount of sun that it takes to redden your skin, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that typically will be 10 minutes for if you're fair skin, a Fitzpatrick skin type of one or two, or maybe even a three. And if you're more like olive skin, like, like maybe I am, uh, I, that's more like 15 minutes, and then if you're darker skin, then it then it could be more like 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes before you start getting that minimal redness. And so, um, if you take that amount of time, uh, if you're let's say you're fair skin and you have 10 minutes, and you put on a sunscreen of SPF 30, then you typically will that'll block you for approximately 300 minutes. Um, so 30 times 10. Right, and so that'll block you for about 300 minutes. Now, that's not considering a million factors. So a lot of people say, "Well, I put an SPF 30 on, I'm good for 300 minutes," you know, and that's typically not the case because you will sweat and you'll break down the sunscreen. Um, the, depending on how intense the sun's rays are, that'll break down the sunscreen as well. Um, so, uh, so you know, the the general rule is to reapply uh, about every couple hours. Um, just to make sure, and again, you have to put on a pretty good thick coat of it in order for it to actually work. But um, uh, as as it says it does. So I always tell my patients, if you're putting on a 30, you're probably going to get a 15 out of it, and if you're putting on, you know, a 50, you may get a 30 out of it. You know, and so because you're going to apply a pretty thin layer of it. Um, uh, but so that's some consideration as far as oil control and what we call acne safe sunscreens. Um, and then there's others. Um, I particularly like again. I don't have any, you know, product bias, but um, I particularly like the Aveeno products, uh, generally because they don't have that sort of greasiness to it. Um, they don't have that real typical, you know, uh, sunblock smell to it, mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of products out there do. And so you can apply it all over your arms, and before you know it, it evaporates, and you didn't don't even know it's there. Great, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's helpful. So you mentioned organic and inorganic sunscreens. Do you have a preference or recommendation when patients ask you which sunscreen should I use? Should they go for ones with physical or chemical um, um, ingredients? Yeah, so typically you have um, a different uh, protection from the different you know compounds found in the sunscreen. So. Uh, we usually recommend broad spectrum, which means it covers both the UVA and UVB. The difference between UVA and UVB is wavelength. 
And uh, the wavelength for UVB is about 290 to 320 nanometer wavelength. And UVA is uh, about 320 to 400 nanometer wavelength. And all that means, to, to put it in simple terms, is uh, if you have UVB, usually it doesn't penetrate as deeply on your skin. So a good way to remember is UVB burns. So if you get redness, it's more likely from UVB, right? So B burns. And then UVA, because it's a larger wavelength, will penetrate deeper into the skin. So the longer the wavelength, the deeper the penetration. And both can cause different types of skin cancers, depending on um, what you're exposed to. And so, um, uh, you know, UVB uh, will give you more of the superficial types of skin cancers. At least that that's what's uh, theoretical, is more of your basal skin, uh, skin cancers and your squamous cell skin cancers. And UVA, potentially, it's being looked into that maybe UVA is causing more like the melanomas, the deep pigment, because UVA actually will be the one that bronzes your skin. So remember, B will burn, but A will actually tan. And so when you're talking about melanocytes, um, that's more the melanomas, right? Because that's all melanoma is, a skin cancer of those particular cells. And so, um, so um, uh, that, uh, you know, in general, will, will, will kind of give you a good idea. But you want to shoot for... Anything that says uh, uh, broad spectrum, because that covers both UVA and UVB. Um, ta um, zinc oxide uh, tends to have a broader uh, spectrum uh, coverage than titanium dioxide. So zinc oxide is usually what, what I recommend. You look for that particular uh, uh, product. And avobenzone is another one. Um, that, that those particular two types of products will give you pretty much as good coverage as pretty much anything else. Okay. And you mentioned a couple different types of skin cancers, um, melanoma and squamous. Uh, could you go over some of the main ones, um, just so people know exactly what they are? I think it was squamous and uh, basal cell and melanoma right. are the, I think the most common. Right. So basal cell, basal cell skin cancer is the most common cancer of mankind. And so, remember, basal cell skin cancer is the most common skin cancer of mankind. So, uh, we see, you know, more of that than anything else, and that's the most common uh, skin cancer that you're going to find. Squamous cell skin cancer is second. So, that's second uh, uh, most common. Melanoma tends to be more of a diagnosis, unfortunately, of younger patients, 20s to 30s. Um, and the most common place to find melanoma is, uh, and a lot of people ask why, but there's no real evidence as of why, um, men typically tend to get their melanomas on their back, and uh, women typically get melanomas in the back of their, of their legs. Why that is, I'm not particularly sure, uh, but it goes to show you how scary it can be because how often do you look at your back, how often do you look at the back of your legs? So a lot of times people will um, come in late uh, after they've probably had that lesion for months and months and months and maybe years and they never knew it was there. And so it brings us back to the topic of getting your annual skin exam um, and how important that is because, um, you know, it could take, it takes 30 minutes to go in and, and uh, to see a doctor and, and get your general skin exam done. Uh, you know, it's recommended once a year, but I always recommend twice a year. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's something that's so important because you don't really, most people don't know what to look for, number one. And if you, even if you do know what to look for, it's hard to find it because a lot of these places that are affected, um, uh, you know, you may not even know it's there. And uh, and a lot of times when you do notice, it's, it's a little too late. The... Uh, the, the problem with melanoma is it doesn't have any symptoms, right? It's not like, like a heart attack where you get chest pain or if you have, you know, uh, you know kidney stones, you, you get, you know, abdominal pain and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, when it comes to melanomas, there's no real symptom to it. It's just a tiny little spot that starts to change very, very slowly. And, uh, you know, again, you don't, you don't even know it, it may be changing. But... Typically, basal cell skin cancer and squamous cell skin cancer do have more symptoms, and those tend to be more itchy, more red, 
maybe they'll bleed a little bit. Uh, a real common scenario is we get a lot of men who get them around their face and they say, you know, a real common story is they will say, it's a uh, area that I nicked when I was shaving that simply didn't resolve. It didn't go away. It didn't heal. And so that's typically your common story is an area that simply won't heal. It looks like you scratch yourself there and it just won't go away, you know. And, um, so those are more like your basal cell skin cancer, squamous cell skin cancer. So, Is there any genetic link between any of those? Um, skin cancer, family history type thing? Right. So I always say, you know, everything's genetic, you know, like if your mom has blue eyes and you're going to get, you may have blue eyes or, you know, if, uh, if, uh, you know, your, your, your dad, uh, has a, a taste for watching, uh, action flicks, then you may have a taste for watching action flicks. And so anything is pretty much genetic. And so skin cancer is just one of those million things that, that, you know, if your parents had, or, you know, first degree relatives had a, a skin cancer, particularly melanoma, then you definitely are at risk. That's one of the red flags that we ask. Um, and uh, so anything's genetic, but, um, but basal cell and squamous cell skin cancer are more related um, typically to uh, chronic sun damage. And, um, uh, but we do see a lot of basal cell skin cancer in young people. Uh, that we do a lot of surgeries on, and uh, uh, but yeah, they're all pretty much genetic. But melanoma is the one we really red flag if you've had a family history of melanoma, because that's definitely one of the red flags that that uh, we look for that you may put you at risk for developing melanoma, um, amongst other things. Um, one of the other things are if you have multiple moles or nevi, um, if you have. Uh, history of sunburns um, as a child um, and even adolescence that uh, doubles your chances of uh, having melanoma. Uh, now tanning bed salons again uh, almost doubles your risk of developing melanoma um, and uh, others are red, red hair, blue eyes, fair skin. Um, if you yourself have had a history of melanoma that's a risk factor. Um, family members, like we were talking about, have uh, had a risk of uh, or have had a history of melanoma. That puts you at risk as well. Um, and another one a lot of people forget about is if you ever had an occupation as an adolescent um, that exposed you to a lot of sun damage. Uh, for example, if you worked on the beach when you were a teenager, if you were a lifeguard, um, those all that can be one of the red flags that I ask for uh, when I uh, screen for risks of melanomas. Okay. And that kind of uh, brings me to my next um, conversation was I was going to ask uh, Kelly Mack a couple questions. Um, she's a physician assistant in Houston for a most uh, uh, surgeon as well. And some of the things that you listed, you know, she has light hair, light eyes. Not meaning to call you out, you worked as a lifeguard. Um, <laughs> and also your father had melanoma. So you're kind of, uh, you know, the prime candidate, but also work in the profession. So I kind of want to ask, what kinds of things would you look for? Um, or when you have patients that come in, do you look for in their skin? I mean, is it just moles? Is it certain spots? Um, you know, is it something that looks abnormal, or sometimes can melanoma be seen as as a regular mole or freckle that's there? Well, of course, they have the ABCDs of melan or of monitoring a mole getting larger, the diameter, color changes, um, and I think what people need to be is more educated on doing skin checks at home. I know, like. Um, Dr. Gomez is saying it's hard to look on your back and notice if a mole is getting bigger or not. And that's, but also, people have to be more proactive as far as <clears throat> there's something on my skin that's there for years, or it's not healing, or it's bleeding, and um, not wait five years when they come in and then see a dermatologist and you know it's a melanoma or it's a squamous cell that's pretty significant because they waited so long with, to have an expert check it out. But there are things that um, we as patients can do to help prevent these and catch it if it is a skin cancer early so that um, steps can be done to take care of it. And I, 
uh, you know, given my history with my dad with melanoma, got me interested in dermatology. Um, and I did everything wrong as a younger teenager. <laughs> I asked my mom the other day, why did you let me tan in tanning beds in high school, knowing my history? And I, I you know, it's hard to argue with someone who's <clears throat> saying, oh, well, I'm an adult and I'm going to go tan. But if I knew the risks and I don't think I was educated enough about what melanoma was, what to look for and what could possibly be the outcome, I just, I didn't understand it. So I think um, educating the public um, to do their own skin checks at home once a month, monitor moles, any, and also if you see something new come up and you don't know what it is, just get in with your dermatologist or your doctor and have them look at it. Do you see, you know, in your practice, um, many patients, uh, repeat patients, so once they have skin cancer, is it common for them to get it again? And again? Yes, especially if I see a patient with a basal cell, which um, Dr. Gomez said is the most common type of skin cancer, you're already then at risk to get more. And I tell them 30 to 50 percent chance, especially if they're younger, because we're seeing younger patients now coming in at 30, 40. They have a lot longer lifespan, and the chance of them getting another skin cancer is, is I don't want to say inevitable, but it's, a, you, you know, they're at risk. So. It is important to educate use of sunblock, sunscreen, long sleeves, hats when you're outside because they can do something to prevent more from occurring, especially the younger population that we're seeing. That yeah, I, um, uh, so if I could just uh, add, add into um, uh, what Kelly was saying was, um, yeah, I typically tell my patients that, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, precancerous lesions, what we call actinokeratosis, which are the uh, precancerous uh, variants of squamous cell carcinomas, um, I typically tell them that uh, once you start getting one of these, I like to compare it to popping popcorn, and I kind of <laughs> put it in those terms, <laughs> and uh, because a lot of people can relate and get sort of the image on that, when that first kernel pops, when you're popping popcorn in the microwave, and then soon thereafter, the rest of the kernels start popping right after that. Uh, actinic keratosis and, and skin cancers tend to do that particular phenomenon as well. As soon as you get one, for some reason or other, you just start popping them out. Um, I don't know if it's maybe your body, as you get older, you uh, lose that capacity to uh, regenerate the DNA repair and to fix itself, and so uh, I'm sure it has something to do with that. Uh, and uh, you, you know, eventually, you just uh, once you get one, you're you're prone to getting others. And the only thing I tell patients, you know, they'll say, "Well, what can I do to 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 not get others?" I say, "Well, you know, you can slow it down by being smart and using sunscreen, long sleeves, and a hat, and avoiding purposeful sun damage." And uh, that's pretty much all you can do because we're constantly exposed to the sun, whether we're driving in the car. Um, or walking to our car and uh, sitting next to a window like Kim is now, um, and uh, <laughs> and so you're constantly <laughs> constantly exposed, and there's nothing you can do. As a matter of fact, a lot of the fluorescent light bulbs that we sit under in the office have uh, ultraviolet uh, rays as well, and so you're constantly exposed. So you just you have to control the things you can control, and that's um, use your sunscreen. Uh, avoid sun tanning, and uh, and then in general that that'll end up paying off. All right. Um, well, I mean, our goal here was kind of to reach a crowd. You know, we talk about younger people um, developing skin cancer and melanoma. Um, you know, even at a younger age than in the twenties and teenagers. Um, and though it is, I think it's the most stubborn group to get to wear sunscreen um, or to change or to educate. To Kelly's point. Uh, but I just wanted to, to leave the floor open if there's anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Gomez-Mead or Kelly, um, anything else you'd like to share with our patients and the public. And Sarah, do you have any other questions? Yeah, I did. I have one more question. And thank yes. you. This has been great, guys. Um, so again, like I said, I just turned 30. And the other day, I went to Whole Foods and I thought, well, I'm going to start putting something on my face every day. And I was just so overwhelmed by everything that was there. 
So if there were one thing that I could do for my skin every day other than sunscreen as far as anti-aging and keeping it moisturized and all of that stuff, if, is there something that you'd recommend as far as a topical cream or as, as an oral supplement? Um, you know what? I'm sure you get that a lot from women. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, not only women, but uh, men as well. And there's, you know, there's only a few things that age the skin. And, and I, I like to tell my patients, you know, it's something that's very controllable. The sun's rays will age your skin, and of course, tanning beds, tanning salons. So it's ironic how people will go to tanning beds and go out and lay out in the sun, like you know, I saw every day at at the, the pool of our apartment complex in Florida or out in South Beach, you know, you see thousands of people laid out to get sun and they do it for quote unquote cosmetic reasons, you know, they like that tan. But in the long run, cosmetically, if you're really concerned about cosmetics, one of the worst things you can do is get, you know, purposeful sun damage because nothing, there's very few things that will age your skin more than the sun's rays. And so um, sun damage is number one, smoking tobacco will age your skin. Uh, exponentially as well and uh, of course time right so uh, uh, those are the three things that will age your skin so two of the three you can control right you use your sunscreen uh, you're smart about your sun exposure and uh, and then of course if you smoke stop smoking because that's controllable too if you're worried about your skin um, and not only that but uh, smoking can also uh, 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 create poor uh, wound healing if you ever have uh, skin cancer surgery, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, potentially maybe even put you at risk for for skin cancer. But um, so the third one you can't control. You know the the time we all age, right? So, um, but if you're if you want a few things um, for your face as far as uh, rejuvenation and maintenance uh, to reverse a lot of sun damage is. Um, the things I typically recommend, and, and most dermatologists um, uh, nowadays are sort of on board, is what are called the retinoids. And retinoids are things like retinol. They have retinol, or retin A is a prescription a strength of, of retinoids. And retinoids um, have been proven to, number one, reverse the uh, uh, sun damage. Uh, number two is uh, it will actually start it'll have a mild bleaching effect on sunspots um, and uh, uh, and uh, number three just general uh, mild skin rejuvenation in general and so it's very beneficial um, when it comes to skin maintenance for your face and um, uh, that's something that you can do and Retin-A you know you've probably heard about it is a common acne medicine um, and so uh, but now there's other brands that sort of market more for the rejuvenation uh, products of it and the only thing with Retin-A is um, you, if you are using a retinoid um, particularly women you know uh, I always say make sure you do it through a physician because um, there are some strengths and some uh, brands of retinoids um, that you can't you have to be careful in breastfeeding and pregnancy and so uh, if you're considering using something like that make sure you do go to a dermatologist you review everything um, before you do start on something like that. Um, and of course the sunscreen, you want to use at least an SPF 30. Um, and there's a lot of brands out there and, and we, 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 like we were talking about earlier, um, basically I, I always say the, 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 a lot of patients ask me, you know, what's the best sunscreen out there? And I say, the best sunscreen out there is the one you use, you know. <laughs> and so <laughs> if you don't like it, you're not going to use it. And so if it's too greasy, it's too oily, it smells funny, you're not going to use it. That's not going to help you at all. So find something that goes well with your skin um, and stick with it. Um, but uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, products out there. Um, uh, La Roche. There's one called La Roche Posay, which um, has a lot of uh, beneficial uh, sun uh, uh, blocking properties and potentially even some sun. Uh, damage reversal properties from the new products it's 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 kind of a funny name La Roche like French Posse um, L A R O C H E uh, hyphen P O S A and uh, that's one brand 
that I recommend. It's typically a little bit more expensive, but it's definitely um, you get a lot of more bang from your buck, and you can find those at a lot of local pharmacies. Um, and then Cetaphil oil control I recommend to a lot of my younger patients, um, and it's an SPF 30, and it's for people who have oily skin, and it just sort of evaporates, and it's an SPF 30. Um, so you put it on, and then it doesn't smell, doesn't, it's not greasy, it goes away, and that's the end of that. It doesn't leave white streaks all over your face. And then again, the Aveeno brand is a, is a good brand that typically will do the same. Um, at least, again, my, my, just my personal experience, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't have any, any uh, uh, favoritism or bias whatsoever with any of the products. Those are the ones I've typically have gotten the best feedback from. Um, and uh, so those are the things. And wear a hat if you're going outside and just avoid purposeful sun exposure. And that's pretty much all you can do. Um, again, avoid the things you can't avoid, and that's really going to gonna help. So retinoids, um, sunscreen, and then sun protection. There was a study once um, on what's called the coffee berry, which is really interesting. They noticed that a lot of people are working in... Uh, in South America and Central America that were uh, picking coffees, coffee berries from the plantations, they noticed they had tons of sun damage all over their skin and the only areas that they didn't have sun damage was on their, their hands. And so they said, well, maybe the coffee berry has some antioxidant properties that reverses sun damage. And so there's some products out there that use coffee berry uh, for their main products and that has very potent antioxidant effects and, and they market it for for face and face rejuvenation and uh, I found those to be beneficial as well. Great. Yeah. With the sunscreens, um, you know, you would probably recommend a separate sunscreen because all of the makeup out there, especially for, for women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, the makeup all have or all state that they have an SPF in them. Do you recommend using a separate sunscreen always and not um, just you know, relying on that uh, SPF that's included in a lot of foundations or powders or makeup that we have. Well, I'm assuming that a lot of the ones that the makeup uh, products do use is probably your physical, you know, your titanium dioxide and your zinc oxide, your physical blockers. Um, but a lot of them uh, uh, are usually a lower sunscreen, like SPF 15 I've seen a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've rarely seen any anything above that, maybe the SPF 30s. I don't know if any of the new lines have it, maybe. Um, but um, uh, because SPF 30 is now the new minimum. So I would say what the best thing to do is put on a good sunscreen and then put your, your uh, makeup on top of it um, because that will sort of cover you just in case. Uh, again, you have to put quite a bit in order to get the true benefit of the SPF 30. And so... If you're putting on a thin layer of foundation, you know, it's probably not going to do much. I mean, it's better than nothing, but, you know, uh, it's probably not going to do too much. Um, so definitely add on top. Okay. Um, also, just, you know, I introduced you um, as a fellowship trained Mohs surgeon, and so we'll talk about skin cancer and sunscreen. Um, I'm curious, you know, most people don't know what a Mohs surgeon does or is and it's you know for skin cancer surgery and I was going to see if you could touch on that a little bit. Sure. Um, Mohs surgery is spelled M-O-H-S um, after the man who uh, invented the procedure his name was Frederick Mohs and he developed it um, as a way to take care of skin cancers um, locally and uh, uh, fix the tissue just on the affected area and spare as much normal tissue as possible and sort of over the years it's uh, gotten to be uh, now it's known as of course Mohs micrographic surgery named after Frederick Mohs and the procedure um, is indicated for skin cancers typically of the head and neck area or larger skin cancers particularly greater than two centimeters on the extremities um, and trunk uh, and then, of course, more invasive skin cancers. And there's a lot of other criteria for having your skin cancer treated with Mohs micrographic surgery. Uh, but the main uh, purpose of the procedure is to typically cut out um, just the affected skin and spare as much normal tissue as possible. And so when you're talking about the head and neck, you know, it makes a lot more sense to cut out just the skin cancer and not take out big chunks and 
and uh, if it's if it's avoidable. Um, uh, and so you cut out just a skin cancer. What we do is we process the tissue there in the office. Uh, we make what are called frozen sections. We freeze the tissue, put it in special stains, make microscopic slides out of it. And uh, us, most surgeons, are trained in the pathology of uh, the skin cancer. And so we look under the microscope, we examine the tissue, and we actually map out um, the tissue that we cut out to correlate with what we cut out on your head and neck um, or on your skin. And so we have uh, specific areas where if we do see cancerous cells, we know exactly where to go back onto your skin and take out just that small portion that's remaining as opposed to just cutting big chunks out blindly. Um, and so after we review the tissue and the microscope slides, we, um, uh, I will then go back and if the skin cancer is completely clear, meaning all the margins are completely clear, and again, that's one of the beauties of uh, Mohs surgery is you have what's called margin control, which means um, you're looking at 100% of the margin all the way around what you cut out the periphery and the deep aspect. And, um, and so uh, if, the, if all skin cancer is gone, then we're trained to do the reconstructive aspect of it. So we will typically stitch you up um, uh, and try, and, and we're trained to do it in a uh, manner that is most conducive towards um, hiding the scar the best. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, uh, stitching the skin together as best as possible, but we can also do grafts if we need to. Uh, we do a lot of flaps for our reconstructions and that sort of thing, and, and amongst other things. So um, so once we get it all out, we, we, we do the reconstruction. If there's still skin cancer remaining, we go back just where the skin cancer is positive and cut out a few more millimeters out of that skin and, um, and then process it again and examine it again and then and so on and so forth until the proceed, until the the margins are completely clear and the skin cancer is completely gone. Um, the cure rate that we have is about 98, 99 percent, and so that tops basically any skin cancer treatment you could ever have, um, uh, as far as any other treatments available. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Does anybody else have? Uh, is there any questions, Kelly, or anybody else? Um, do you see now what they're terming as in it? an actual addiction to patients who are tanning in tanning beds? <clears throat> right, so, tanning you know, there's actually... I've seen one patient where I really would have said that. It is very interesting. She actually worked at MD Anderson Cancer Center as a nutritionist. Knew the, you know, I mean, you're working at a cancer center, but she was so dark, and she said to me once the doctor left the room, that's my only time where I can relax and be calm, and it's I'm like, but you could go lay on the couch. But, you know, it, it's like she really was like, well, I'll cut down from every other day to maybe twice a week. And couldn't get the, it, you know, and it was really surprising. I'd never seen someone, she had a basal cell skin cancer, too, on her nose. And she couldn't correlate. I mean, if it, and Dr. Joseph, who I worked for, was like, that is, she truly is has an addiction to tanning. <clears throat> yeah, so they did studies about that, and it turns yeah. out there's some there's some truth to it. Um, they um, discovered that there's a there's a hormone uh, that's released by your pituitary gland um, that causes the darkening of your skin, and that same uh, region uh, will actually release a lot of hormones that give you a sense of satisfaction, and so. When you tan, um, there is, uh, you know, you can't quantify it, but there is a sense of, you know, feeling relaxed and that happy, warm, fuzzy feeling, um, and there is, there is a lot of truth to that. And um, uh, now, you know, obviously making that a daily routine, you, you can kind of see how people can become addicted to uh, tanning because you maybe become you know, again, theoretically become, uh, you know, uh, getting to like that, that feeling that you get every time you tan. And so um, there is some truth to that. But, yeah, there is a lot of patients that are uh, truly addicted to that. But um, it's hard to tell if it's because of that or more of a routine. A lot of people are very routine-oriented. And so a lot of people are, quote, unquote, addicted to working out, right? And so 
so you know, if you work out at 3 p.m. every day, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, that are quote unquote addicted to working out can't sleep at night if they didn't work out that night. And so, uh, or if it's watching American Idol or whatever it is, you know, that you're addicted to. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, so there's there's all sorts of different uh, ways to look at it. But yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of people that that become very accustomed to getting a tan despite the fact that it could potentially harm you um, and, uh, and and it's tough it's tough to convince them I've had similar patients that have had skin cancers and and uh, it's tough to negotiate you know that part uh, to tell them that, that that they they should not be tanning uh, a lot like you know someone who's had lung cancer should not be smoking cigarettes anymore you know and so um, and so it's hard to convey that sometimes when someone is truly, truly used to having that done, and they've probably done it for years and years. So, mm -hmm. so you do the best you can, and, and you inform the patients the best you can, and, and you make them aware of the risks, and um, all, you know, and, and, and kind of wish for the best. Um, but I try to really devote a lot of time towards educating patients because, you know, I uh, most patients are not. Uh, you know, physicians, and they don't, they may not know uh, what a lot of times they're doing that could be potentially harming them, and you can't blame them. I mean, I may not know about something that, that I, I don't routinely do every day either, and so um, my, my job really entails informing and educating patients so that they can make wiser decisions, um, and, and, uh, and I, I like to devote a lot of time to doing that because I think by doing that, you end up preventing a lot of problems for them and and uh, and potential surgeries and scarring and all the things that come with skin cancer. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else or any other questions or any other comments for our hangout today? It's been great, guys. Thank you. I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for joining us and thanks, Kelly, and thank you, Dr. Gomez Mead. We appreciate it, and I guess just to reiterate, get your skin checked by your dermatologist, um, and there are also free skin cancer screenings. Um, you know, the Skin Cancer Foundation has the Road to Healthy Skin Tour that goes every year. Uh, Vitology participated yesterday, and it's coming to Houston and Arlington in the next week or so, but, you know, just keep your uh, eyes and ears out and wear your sunscreen. But we want to thank everybody today, and hope you have a good one. Thank you. Thank all you guys. Right. Thanks for thanks for joining us and uh, and all the best. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>